and I'll hand over to Sunny yeah. and Jess. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'll pull so, up my screen as a to yeah. share the screen. So my name's Sunny and this is Jess. Hi, Hi everybody. Everybody. Jess. <laughs> So we're both student clinicians currently on placement in the Paediatric Fluency Clinic. And as Paula has already introduced herself, she is the speech pathologist and coordinator of the clinic. Uh, so we've got the screen here. Oh, let me just minimise that one. Perfect. So as Paula said, we'll be recording the session today, um, but don't worry, we'll be fully confidential. We won't be sharing it with anybody. It'll be all within the clinic for our learning. So today we're here to tell you more about the Pediatric Fluency Clinic at La Trobe Communication Clinic. So we just call that LCC for short. So more specifically, Jess and I will discuss the Lidcomb program, and that's what we use to treat stuttering in children in this clinic. So I'm sure many of you will have questions today. So hopefully we'll be able to answer a lot of them throughout the session. And we'll also have a Q&A at the very end. Throughout the session, um, you can also write questions in the chat if you'd like, and then we can answer that all at the end. So next slide. So what is stuttering? Stuttering is a communication difficulty that causes involuntary interruptions in the flow and rhythm of speech. So stuttering, Everyone has, can have hesitations, like I just did, or interruptions in their speech from time to time. This is called normal disfluency. However, in stuttering, the interruptions and the disfluency in, speed, in speech is noticeably disrupted by the flow of the conversation, and that can impact the message a person is trying to convey. So these interruptions can manifest in many forms, and this will be discussed um, shortly. So next is the onset of stuttering. Onset can be sudden or gradual and usually develops between the ages of two and four years. It may vary between um, very mild or severe. That's when it begins. The presentation of stuttering can also varies between each child in terms of their frequency and severity. Now I'll pass it on to Jess. Yep, so hi everyone. As Sunny mentioned, my name's Jess and I'm going to start by talking about the causes of stuttering. So the exact cause of stuttering is currently unknown, but the research suggests that there is a genetic component. What we do know is that stuttering is not caused by anxiety, shyness, family dynamics or low intelligence levels. Research also indicates that stuttering affects more boys than girls at a ratio of four boys for every one girl. So stuttering has been successfully eliminated when it is treated early enough using a program called the Lidcomb program, which is what we implement at, at the Latrobe Communication Clinic. So it's important to note that although anxiety doesn't cause stuttering, stuttering may cause your child may make your child feel anxious about talking or even in some circumstances more frustrated. And this can affect how they participate in activities at school and home. We need to be mindful about how your child is feeling so that we can use effective strategies to support them in their speaking. Next slide. So now I'll talk about the types of stuttering. So there are three main categories of stuttering behaviours. And the first is repeated movements, which includes the repetition of a sound, syllable, word or phrase. So for example, a repeated movement at the sound level may sound something like this. So in the first example, we've got, I, 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 I love eating cake. Fixed postures occur when a child gets stuck on a sound within in or within the word. Fixed postures with audible airflow, also known as prolongations, may sound like the person is stretching out a sound at the beginning or within a word. So a fixed posture with audible airflow may sound something like this, snake. Fixed postures without audible airflow, also known as blocks, may appear as the person is struggling to get a word out often presenting at the beginning of a word. A fixed posture without audible airflow may sound like this. Ball. 
So as you can see, there was a pause before I said the word ball. Next slide. Types of stuttering behaviours. So we also know that there are superfluous behaviours, which are those that occur alongside repeated movements and fixed postures. They would not be present if the person was not stuttering and they tend to be more common in more severe or persistent stutterers. Verbal behaviours include interjections. So for example, oh well, oh well, well, um, um. We are all guilty of inserting fillers such as um and like in typical speech. So the frequency of this behaviour needs to be considered in relation to its impact on the targeted message. Associated nonverbal characteristics often develop when a person who stutters becomes aware of and are anxious about their non-fluent speech. These can include eye blinking, facial grimaces, avoidance of eye contact, avoidance of speaking situations, body tension and movement. Next slide. Okay, so I'll now, now we'll back onto to <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Now I'd like to talk um, about the Libcom program. So let's start by watching a video. Let's see if we can get it to work. <laughs> The Litcom program is a stuttering treatment developed for children younger than six years old. What happens in the Litcom program? First of all, parents learn how to do the treatment with their child during weekly visits to the clinician. During these visits, the clinician teaches the parent by demonstrating various features of the treatment, helping the parent to do the treatment with their child and giving the parent feedback about how they're going. It's the clinician's job to make sure that the treatment is done just right for the child and that the whole process is a positive experience for the child and the family. It's important that parent feedback emphasises the child's stutter-free or fluent speech. Only occasionally a parent gives feedback when the child stutters. It's also important that the parent does not comment on the child's speech all the time, but chooses specific times during the day during which to give the child feedback. Choosing the best times to give feedback is one of the things that the parent and clinician work out together. As well as learning how to give the feedback effectively, the parent also learns to measure the child's stuttering each day using a simple procedure. The Litcom program has two stages. During stage one, the parent conducts a treatment each day and the parent and child attend the speech clinic once a week. This continues until stuttering is either gone or reaches an extremely low level. Stage two of the program starts at this time and lasts around a year. The aim of stage two is to keep the stuttering from returning. All children and families are different and the clinician takes this into account when supervising the treatment. While the essential features of the treatment as set out in the Litcom program treatment guide are always included, the way they are implemented is adjusted to suit each family and child. The treatment guide can be downloaded free of charge from this website by following the link on this page. Thanks. Okay, so I sound on. The Lidcom program is an evidence-based behavioural treatment that uses the principles of operant conditioning. The operant conditioning rewards good behaviour with praise and attention and is more likely to be learned as compared to a behaviour that's not met. Oh, thank you, Paula. Got that up there. Sorry. That is not met with a response or with punishment. The Lidcom program encourages parents to reward their child with praise and attention for status-free speech. There are currently a number of, of approaches to stuttering therapy but the Lidcom program has the strongest evidence to support its use for preschool age children and some evidence for school age children. So I would like to add that the Fluency Clinic in LCC only runs on Thursdays. So it would be a good consideration as to whether the clinic would be one that works well for your family. 
So although the, lid, um, although the research evidence for the Lidcombe program for school-aged children is not as strong as that of preschool-aged students, of uh, children, the cl clinic has seen school-aged children success stories. We make some adaptations to the method. We approach therapy for school-aged children. For example, verbal praise may be less motivating for school-aged children as compared to preschool-aged children. So something we suggest is to introduce different forms of rewards as motivation for them. So something like giving them more time on an iPad. We may also suggest to add, adjust your expectations a little bit. So aiming for a severity rating of two rather than a severity rating of zero, for example. And Jess will go through the severity, severity ratings later on for you. Another thing that we have introduced is currently due to COVID, the Pediatric Fluency Clinic is currently only running online via Zoom. So that's something that we call telehealth. So delivering the Lidcombe program via telehealth has been proven through extensive research to be just as effective as face-to-face -face therapy. So there's no disadvantage to receiving the intervention online. Um, it is a parent-based training program where you're receiving the same level of education as we would do in the face-to-face -face sessions as well. And as part of this telehealth structure, we ask that you record and send us your audio visual clips of your child's speech and occasionally of your practice sessions with your child so that we can provide you with feedback during the online sessions. And once again, um, we respect all confidentiality. It won't be sent out to anyone. It's all just for our own learning purposes. So what to expect during assessment? At LCC, the process begins with sending referral information. So once that is received, the new referrals are invited to attend a parent information session, which is a prerequisite of the Pediatric Fluency Clinic. Following this session, you'll be put on a waiting list for an assessment. The process from the initial referral to the assessment at the moment is a wait of approximately 12 months. There is also a wait for treatment once the child is assessed, if they're considered suitable for the clinic. So some stage one clients have been waiting on treatment since last year. Um, the reason for this is because we have about three to four places for stage one clients, and they can take up to about 28 sessions to complete stage one alone. So the places for treatment are very limited. So when you come in for assessment, um, this is what we do. So we discuss the policies and procedures at LCC and we'll get you to fill in some forms as well. Discuss the case history information you've provided us. Uh, observe your child talking. So we're looking at types of stuttering behaviours, how frequent they are and your child's ability to communicate as well. We will also then discuss our observations with you as well as your observations. So, and finally, we'll discuss the expectations of the Lidcombe program. So following this assessment session, if your child requires therapy, they will be placed on the waiting list for the therapy. If your child has been stuttering for longer than 12 months, it is unlikely for natural recovery to happen. So therapy would be highly encouraged. Um, as the waiting times are very long, we do encourage people to seek alternative service providers in the meantime, as the longer a child is stuttering, stuttering, the harder it is to treat. So what to expect during therapy? The Lidcombe program has a set outline and expectations need to be met in order for it to be successful. So what should you expect during the therapy? You'll be trained to deliver the therapy. Uh, weekly clinics visits uh, or through telehealth is 12 to 28 sessions on average, but it would take 12 to 16 weekly therapy sessions to complete stage one, but can take up to 28 sessions depending on the level of severity and age of the child. Uh, so we'll chat a bit more in detail, detail about that and about the two stages, stages in just a minute. So there's also daily practice sessions. Uh, these go for about 10 to 15 minutes and these sessions uh, seek to provide an environment for your child where they can practice their smooth speech and you can give them feedback. There is also daily severity ratings and this is a tool that we use to measure your child's stuttering severity. 
Verbal contingencies or VCs are also used. And this provides feedback that you can use to reward your child for using stutter-free speech. Later in the program, you may occasionally provide feedback for stuttered speech. But this should not be the focus. The focus should always be on the smooth speech. The program is intensive, we'll tell you that now, but you're preventing your child from having a lifelong disability. And most importantly, the therapy will must be fun and positive and effective to keep your child entertained and motivated. So let's pass it on to Jess. Yeah, thanks, Sunny. So now I'm just gonna chat about the verbal contingencies. So as we mentioned, verbal contingencies are the feedback you use to reward your child for using stutter-free speech or occasionally to indicate stuttered speech as well. So there are three types of verbal contingencies for stutter speech. The first is praise. So for example, you might say, wow, that was so smooth or great smooth talking. Acknowledgement, which is very matter of fact. For example, that was smooth. And the third is request for self-evaluation. So for example, you would ask the child, was that smooth? It's important that the answer to this question is always yes. We don't want the child to be in doubt. So you would only provide that verbal contingency if they were smooth. There are two types of verbal contingencies for stuttered speech. The first is acknowledge, which again is very matter of fact. So for example, you might say that was bumpy. And the second is request for self-correction. So for example, you might say, dog was bumpy. Can you try say that again? If you commence the LIDCOM program, you should start with the verbal contingencies for stutter-free speech, as the focus should be on providing feedback for stutter-free speech. We wanna make sure that the experience is positive for the child, as Sunny mentioned, and if they are not enjoying it, or they become disheartened by negative feedback, then they may not benefit as much. When verbal contingencies for stuttered speech are introduced, it is important to only occasionally provide this type of feedback. So the rule is that for every 10 verbal contingencies you provide for stutter-free speech, you can provide one verbal contingency for stuttered speech. So now I've got a short video of a practice session to watch. This is actually one of my clients. That was smooth. Just checking you can hear it. Yeah. Yep, yep. That's a tie. I think the dog wants to wear some glasses. The yellow sunglasses, mm -hmm. they're cute. I think the dog, I think Milo wants to wear the red hat. That sounds really with, smooth. Even with white and black. Mm hmm. Very smooth. Next. Okay, my angry dog wants to wear some stripy glasses. Beautiful, smooth. He has to, so wear. I think the do I think my angry dog wants to wear a baseball cap because he's because he's going to be going to a baseball thing. Yeah. And I think my finally my dog wants to wear some stripy glasses. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay, my dog wants to eat a bone because all dogs eat bones. That was really smooth. I think the dog wants to eat a, a chicken burger because I love chicken burgers. Mm -hmm. Smooth. I think the I think my dog wants to eat an ice cream. That sounds really and then, nice. And then he's going to eat them all in one. <sighs> he's a monster, not a dog. <laughs> they say eat. My dog needs some protective glasses. Mm-hmm. Smooth talking. Coats. Raincoat. Nice. Smooth talking. I I think my dog needs to balance his umbrella on his head. <laughs> my dog wants to my dog wants to wear a bag, a handbag. Smooth, nice, smooth talking. Okay. I think 
Mm-hmm. Very smooth. I think my dog wants to wear some glasses. He has very, really small eyes. I really like how smooth you are seeing. I think my dog wants to wear a coat because it's winter time. Nice. And that's all you mean. So. Beautiful. Smooth talking. Birthday. Okay. My dog wants the birthday cake to stuff it all on his face. <laughs> very smooth, very nice. And his hat and his present. Because mm. like all birthdays are about presents. That all sounds really smooth. Well done. Wow, what is this? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to stuff it all into his face. <laughs> okay, my dog wants to dress up as as a famous person, but, but they are not showing their skin. Mm -hmm. What's that? My, my dog wants to eat his, his own bone. There was something bumpy. My dog wants to eat his own pink one because he hates the color pink. That was better. Well done. Next. Go next. The green one. Green or blue, yeah. Ah. Thanks for that, Paula. So stage one of the LibCom program is the most intensive with weekly clinic visits and practice sessions every day. So this stage is where most of the learning occurs for both you and your child. The weekly clinic visits will involve a discussion of how practice sessions have been going at home and the severity ratings from the week. The clinicians will also take a severity rating from the session if the child is present. The clinician will demonstrate a new learning item, which might be a new activity or the introduction of a new verbal contingency. During stage one, it is important to complete daily practice sessions and take daily severity ratings. Prior to each clinical session, we often ask parents to send their weekly severity ratings and a recording or audio of their child's speech in a natural context, as well as sometimes during a practice session. The overall goal of stage one is to achieve no stuttering or nearly no stuttering. Next slide. Mm. Yeah, so here are some figures um, about how long it typically takes to complete stage one of the program. So 50% of clients complete stage one in 16 weekly sessions and 90% of clients complete stage one by session 28. Yeah, so this is a diagram which demonstrates how stage one sessions typically run. So first, the clinician will have a natural conversation with the child and the parent or caregiver. During this time, the parent or caregiver and the clinician will rate the severity of the child's stutter using the Lidcomb severity rating scale, which I will show you on the next few slides. Next, the clinician will check the parent's severity rating to ensure that both ratings coincide. If the provided severity ratings differ, the clinician will use a severity ratings guide to come to an agreement with the parent. The clinician and the parent will then have a discussion about the previous week of therapy. The clinician may ask questions about the verbal contingencies, practice sessions and severity ratings. And during this time, the parent or caregiver also has the opportunity to flag areas of difficulty, ask questions or problem solve with the clinicians. Next, the parent often demonstrates the verbal contingencies which are used at home during therapy with the child. The clinician will offer feedback and, write, and make recommendations about how things could improve or how to move forward. Next, the clinician may demonstrate the verbal contingencies with the child depending on their needs. 
And finally, the clinician will work with the parent to plan for the following week before concluding the session and summarising the information. Next, I'll move on to stage two of the Lidcombe program. So stage two, the child will begin stage two of the Lidcombe program once they have achieved no stuttering or nearly no stuttering for about maintenance. Clinic visits occur less frequently. During these visits, the parent or caregiver and clinician will problem solve any difficulties occurring. The parent or caregiver effectively becomes the speech pathologist by this point because they are independently managing their child's stuttering. The first two visits will occur once a fortnight. The next two visits will occur once every four weeks. The next two will occur once every eight weeks. And then the final one or two will be at the 16 week mark. Stage two involves approximately six to 10 maintenance sessions before the child completes the program. The overall goal is that the child maintains no stuttering or nearly no stuttering for a long time. And we want the child to be able to consistently maintain their smooth speech without the need for ongoing feedback. Now I'm just going to show you our severity ratings table, which we use as a guide with the Lidcombe program. So we have mentioned severity ratings throughout this presentation. Severity ratings are important because this is how we measure the severity of the child's stutter to assess how the child is progressing throughout the therapy. So as you can see, severity ratings take into account the types of stutters, how easy the child is getting their message across, whether the child's speech sounds effortful and whether another person would notice the stuttering. Across the top, there are various categories, no stuttering, extremely mild, mild, moderate, severe and extremely severe. So as an example, a child with a severity rating of two is classified as mild as they may present with occasional repetitions or occasional prolongations or occasional blocks, but they still get their message across quite easily. Their speech does not sound effortful, but another person probably might notice their stuttering. If you would like, you can take a moment now to consider what you would rate the severity of your child's stuttering this morning ranging from no stuttering at zero to extremely severe on the scale. And now, yeah, so I can see someone's put in the chat, eight. I might also show you our severity ratings chart. And we've got another response, four to five. So this is an example of the severity rating chart we'll be sending to you to use in the program. Each block represents a week. And in each of the individual columns within each block are separate columns to represent each day of the week. You simply place a dot on the line that correlates with what, you, with what rating you have decided to give your child as to the severity of their stuttering for that day as a whole. I'll now move on to Sunny and she might discuss more about early intervention. So early intervention is important to treat stuttering. Speech pathologists need extra postgraduate training to be able to deliver the Lidcombe program. So if you look for a private speech pathologist, um, really ensure that they've got extra training in the Lidcombe program. The Trobe is not the only clinic in Melbourne that does the Lidcombe program either, but it is a cheaper option. The program is mostly delivered by final year La Trobe University students, um, speech pathology students, obviously. And as previously mentioned, the program only operates on a Thursday with four or five places for therapy and it could take between 10 to 30 sessions for a client to move on to stage two and to free up one of those spots. So sometimes therapy can take longer if a client has other factors. So that can be such as ASD or English as a second language, which means the therapy may take a little longer, but then sometimes children recover more quickly than expected as well. So it's hard to tell and it's very dependent on, the num on a number of factors. So you might be asking, what can I do to help my child? So if you're waiting for a spot in the program, 
there are some things that you can do to help your child. So firstly, focus on the content of your child's speech and not on the stuttering. Resist the urge to help your child finish their sentence and let them finish it themselves unless they request for help. So we know that sometimes reducing the difficulty of language makes it e easier to speak with smooth talking and to minimize verbal demands. So there are some strategies that you can use. So for example, you can ask questions. So for example, what is the dog eating? Or include the answer in the question. So is the dog eating a bone? Uh, using commands instead of questions. So for example, look at the dog who is eating a bone. Or using short, simple sentences. That dog is eating a bone. You can also encourage nonverbal activities. Jess, on to you. Sorry, I was on mute. So now I'm gonna talk about some things that commonly exasperate stuttering. So in addition, it may be helpful to consider the situations that may make your child stutter more and to avoid these where you can, especially on their bad days. Every child is different. So the factors that might exasperate your child's stutter may be completely different to someone else's child. So some common factors that increase a child's stuttering include fatigue. So speaking clearly is a demanding task. And when your child is tired, this may be difficult to keep up. Excitement. You may have noticed that your child's stuttering becomes worse when they are playing with their friends or siblings. When a child is excited, sometimes speaking clearly is simply a forgotten task. Anxiety, so though anxiety doesn't cause stuttering, sometimes it can influence how much your child stutters. Complex grammar, so the more complex the speaking task is, the more likely your child's attention shifts to what they are saying and how, rather than how they are saying it. So this also applies to when your child is using abstract language. Some strategies for helping reduce stuttering. So we know that complex speaking tasks can make it hard for your child to be stutter free. And in the Libcom program, we want children to start to practice their smooth talking so we can give them feedback for their smooth talking. We do this at first by using easy speaking tasks, which are more likely to result in stutter free speech. These tasks can minimize how much thinking the child needs to be doing and all the length of their sentences. Then as children get more practice at using smooth talking at easier levels, then they can move on to more complex activities that have less structure, for example, casual conversation. The main thing is that children are practicing being smooth or stutter free every day, and the parent is then able to give feedback for the smooth talking. The feedback or the verbal contingencies are known as the medicine in the Lidcombe program. But if the child is not using smooth talking, they can't get the feedback, therefore we need to make it smooth. We need to make it easier for them to be smooth. The diagram on the right illustrates this process and may help you understand how to build up your child's ability to produce smooth speech. So on the left hand side of the diagram, we have examples of questions that you can ask your child that require less complex answers to more complex answers. So at the top, the first questions are who is that and what can you see? which typically may only require a one to two road response. Whereas at the bottom, more complex questions include why and when, which may require the child to elaborate a bit more. On the right side are examples of activities that decrease in the amount of structure and hence become more complex for your child. So at the top, controlled activities are listed, which include counting, nursery rhymes and repetitive speech, such as ABCs, which are typically easier. And then at the bottom, we have open conversation in a more naturalistic environment, which can be harder to maintain smooth speech. So hopefully that diagram gives you a practical idea of how to teach children to be smooth and why we do it that way. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We'll now move to a Q&A. So please feel free to ask Paula or ask any questions that you may have, and we can try our best to answer. And also, I think Paula also has a survey that she would like you to complete just in regards to the presentation, how you found it, and if there were any changes that you could suggest for us. So thank you. And if you felt more comfortable, you could use the chat function too to ask your questions, or you could turn on your mic. 
Hi everyone. People. How are you? Anyone have any questions? Is there a link to those documents? I will be sending you the slide presentation and we'll also send you uh, a list of speech pathologists who are working in the area of Lidcombe and have training in the Lidcombe program. Uh, yeah, and there are a couple of um, documents which have got strategies for helping children to like facilitate this fluent speech. So we will be emailing those to you after the presentation uh, today. But yeah, so don't worry if you if you want more detail or you want a record of those those slides, we, we're, we're sending them to you. And after today, we'll put your names onto the assessment waiting list space and you'll get seen in order. But obviously it was a, so my son is, cut it out. Molly said, made a comment there. Any options in Geelong? Well, as I said, this is a, an on, online program that we, we run via telehealth. So uh, it doesn't, I don't think it really matters where you are. He, she thought the program program's not working. Okay, Molly, do you want to unmute yourself? What I would say is sometimes it's not working and we need to problem solve why it's not working. So why wasn't it working for your son? That's what I would be asking because most children actually do respond to it, but it needs to be adjusted based on what their child's needs are and uh, different family situations require a certain a different approach. So yeah, I can see more questions there. Hang on. Uh, okay. Yes. So I will be, yeah. So Geelong, therapists in Geelong, I'll send you the link to, uh, sorry, the list of speech pathologists who work in Lidcombe, but definitely telehealth is a very effective option. We get parents to send through their recordings and we use those as our way to evaluate and give feedback and it works just as effectively as face-to-face. -face. So it's one of those things where you go, yeah, I can like, finally, I, I chose the right profession. It does work in a pandemic to, to you know, you can actually treat stuttering via um, telehealth, which other, maybe other professionals might not have that advantage that we've got a strong evidence base for using telehealth for us. So wherever you are, it could still be effective. Any su supplies are good at stuttering? Mernda. How long before my son gets assessed? It's a big question, isn't it? Yeah, it's usually about a 12 month wait, unfortunately. But I'm trying to increase the number of days at Latrobe for this so uh, we can increase the amount of um, therapy we provide because it is obviously very demanding and very intensive and expensive. So um, yeah, but that's still, hopefully next year we'll get an extra day and it means that the waiting list will reduce significantly but yeah it's about a 12 month wait but usually therapy is pretty like not that much longer after that but in the meantime I yeah if your child was a seven or an eight according to the severity rating I would be looking at other options if you had you know for, you know the, if you had that I know it's expensive but I blame the government they should be they should be uh, subsidizing this this therapy because it's so effective. And Jula is talking, but I don't know if you're talking to us. People who are on mute, I can't hear you. What age should we apply this? Sorry? Paula, I take you. Hello, I take. Can you hear me? Hi. Um, what, when you say um, that these private sessions, what, what kind of costs are we looking at? How much does it cost? Well, private, private therapy, um, I, I work in the private sector and I charge 180 per session. And there's a Medicare rebate, it's $53.80. And it's been the same for 20 years. And it used to cover about three quarters of the cost of a session and now it covers about like less than a third or a quarter. So it's really, you know, this has not, the, the, it hasn't really been adjusted for, 
inflation for 20 years. Um, it, yeah, so it becomes expensive for parents. Mm, that's and, and do you think um, it kind of takes the same number of sessions? I think depending on who you, you see, it's very hard. As, as Sunny said, you really need to make sure the person has training in Lidcombe. And uh, if they haven't, it's sometimes like may not work or may take longer. So, yeah, you have to be careful about who you, you, you go to. And Brenda Carey has the... Uh, training as well so her therapy which they implement online is available as well yes yeah, so. oh, okay so, so not all speech pathologists use this live train program not all people are not all speech pathologists are trained mm -hmm. in it it's a it's an additional training but although the students who have gone through this clinic are trained but not all speech pathology mm -hmm. students get to go through this particular clinic so it's so it, it, you just have to ask if you're trained in Lidcom. Right. Yeah, the, the list you provide will that have like Lidcom? All the speech pathologists on the list are, are, are trained. Right. Okay. Yep. I'm on the list too, but I'm not trying to like conflict of interest. I'm not trying to advocate for my own service, but I'm just yeah, saying, yeah, I'm just good. Yeah, no, yeah, I understand. There are other speech pathologists also who are trained, and I think as long as like yeah, it gives you a little bit of a head start. If you've got, you know, the list, that, yeah. So we'll send that to you. But if you get in early enough, definitely you can have like the therapy has more impact. So, uh, yeah, it's frustrating for me. Believe me, it's very frustrating. But it's a, such an intensive program, and we do make sure the children recover, like because we do it by the book. We we use uh, the program as it's been written, and. Yeah, it does mean though that it takes a like a while for people to get through, and so for places to be freed up, it it's yeah, it takes more time. Um, if you can find someone in community health, but I think sometimes it's capped in terms of how many sessions you're allowed through community health, so it's not always ideal. And you're only able like I'm advocating, believe me, I'm advocating for speech pathology clients, uh, but. It's, yeah, it's this ongoing challenge that we have to try and allow, like, access to this because it is so, you know, significant in terms of communication later on in life if you don't have uh, the ability to speak fluently. So, but, and we do have the knowledge to, to address it at an early age. And it can be effective at school age, which often sometimes children are seen in community health and then they come to um, the Latrobe Communication Clinic for that second stage for the maintenance. So we often see school-aged children. Um, I'm trying to sound positive. Can I ask a question? I appreciate it. Thanks, Ata. Uh, yes, can I, oh, yeah, um, you were saying that you were looking at potentially, um, hang on, honey, um, uh, including an additional day in next yes. year. What yes. day would that be potentially? I don't know yet, but it'll probably be either Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. A pardon? Sorry, I didn't catch that. It'll be either Tuesday, Wednesday or maybe Thursday again, but probably Tuesday or Wednesday. So additional to the Thursday ones? Yes. Can I also ask, um, you were saying to get in early um, based on the severity rating. Um, with that severity rating, it, you were saying that to, the chart, well, sorry, the... What am I trying to say here? Between the ages of two and is it four or five that they start to stutter? Yeah. Um, some people say wait till they're three before you go, yes, this is going to be a longer term issue. Yeah. Um, is that the case or not? Because I've heard all varying. My son's not three yet, yeah. um, but his stuttering is evident. Yeah. Look, I think you can see pretty early whether or not it's a – like going to be developmental or whether it's going to be actually a disorder. And that really depends on the type of stutters. So if he's blocking and he's really got a lot of effortful speech, at, even at a young age, it could definitely, you can identify it and diagnose stuttering at under three. Under three and okay. Yeah. And I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to get it assessed or get it 
get intervention because, I mean, I definitely have treated under three-year-olds, like two-and-a-half-year-olds who were speaking fine and then suddenly they have a burst of language. They have this kind of explosion of language and then suddenly the stutter increases because at that before that they weren't needing to speak as, as much. Linguistic complexity is a factor. So when they're speaking more complex sentences, the yeah. stuttering comes out. Yeah, and that's what I've noticed. Have you? Yeah. So yeah, the I language think, is kicked in and the yeah. stuttering's come in and it comes and goes. Yeah. Um, and you were saying the earlier, the better. Um, so yeah, just wanted to know whether you like, you know, the treatment of kids under three, whether that's a good idea or people say, wait till they're after three, but I, I guess it's better I, to start. I wouldn't wait. Do you know what? I wouldn't wait with stuttering. I think it's so effective at such a young age that yeah. you could actually make a difference even as a toddler, as a young, you know, under three year old, depending on the speech pathologist mm. and okay. their, their experience. But uh, I, I think with stuttering, wait and see approach, you, you know, you could end up with a more intractable as word, stutter, because of the time that they've had stuttering. And right. you want to know earlier whether or not you, you think this is maybe developmental and they're just thinking and trying to put ideas together or whether it's an actual physiological in, a coordination issue that's a motor problem and that is what stuttering is. It's not about their thinking, it's about... The, the coordination between the muscles and the breathing and the thoughts. And that is more of a, like, I guess, officially a diagnosis of a stutter. And that's treatable, absolutely, even at a young age. Are both the types treatable? You were saying there's one that's a disorder and one developmental, that's... Yeah, developmental or, or normal disfluency yep. is just really about children, you know, trying to get their language to, like, match their, their thoughts. It's not so much a physical problem. Whereas stuttering that's involving blocking or repetitions that are, are frequent, uh, effortful speech, that is more what you would indi more indicative of uh, stuttering as okay. opposed to normal disfluency. And sometimes it can fluctuate and we can have um, variability in the early stages of stuttering. But think about whether there's a family history of stutter stuttering. Think about whether or not the child is frustrated by their stuttering or by the, the, the communication, that is an indicator that it's not necessarily just normal fluency. Okay. Any more like four or five repetitions and yep. blocks, those prolongations, those fixed posture stutters, they are more indicative of a true stutter as opposed to normal disfluency, which might be a phrase, can I, can I, can I go out? That would be just maybe typical disfluency. But mm -hmm. if a child is saying, I, 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 I want yeah. something, then that is more what I would describe as a stutter. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. That's what I wanted you to show me. Yeah. Now I understand what you mean. Yeah. Okay. So cool. then definitely Thank get you. on every list. Okay. But I, um, yeah, I empathize. I really empathize with parents because it's so worrying when a child can't get their message out and you know they're capable of more than they can achieve, but a stutter is you know, interfering with that. So I, I think it can be heartbreaking too. As well. yes. Any other questions? Hello, Natalie, hands up. Hi. Hi. Um, I, my son, I've done the Lincoln program before with my son um, when he was about three. We did it for about 10 months, but we weren't able to complete the program because our speech therapist changed and the new one just didn't have experience in the program. And so we decided we didn't do it anymore. Um, and I've been on waiting lists with private and public speech therapists ever since. And he's started prep this year. Would it be beneficial to do the Lincoln program again? Oh, at that age, definitely, definitely at that age, still within the range, that is, it's a very effective program. Um, yeah, under seven, I think, is pretty still uh, going to benefit yeah. from the Lincoln. Even older than that, we, we find children benefit. So even more severe stutterers at an older age have, have recovered and eliminated their stuttering to a point where they can communicate their message very easily, uh, despite having quite severe blocks when they started. So school-aged children definitely benefit from Lidcombe, uh, but it can take longer and it can be 
maybe you might need to add other little additional kind of strategies as well. But yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, if he still stuttering, I would be, yeah. He was like when he first, he was like very severe, like it would take 20 minutes to get one little sentence out. Like he had all the blockages, repetitions, prolongations, like he's really on that severity scale. Always, every now and again, it's like, he was really good and didn't and it's coming back. Um, oh, and yeah, so I would be getting, I definitely would be getting onto it. Like if you have attended today, you'll be on the, the waiting list and over Christmas, I'm hoping like January, February, Eva. December and January, I'm hoping that we'll maybe get to see a few more assessments. But it is, I don't really want to necessarily assess people and then say, well, now you have to wait for a year for a therapy place. So I don't know that that's as, as effective as saying, okay, when you're assessed, I want you to be pretty much getting your therapy straight away. So I, I'm, yeah, it means if, you, yeah, you don't necessarily see as many assessments, but it could be that maybe we need to just check in with people and confirm whether or not there is actually a stutter that the parent needs to follow up with maybe another service. So I don't know what, what would you prefer? Would you prefer to be seen earlier for an assessment and then know that you might have to wait longer for therapy as parents like what's your preference or like you know it's it's just so demand there's so intensive this program and there's so much demand for it it's it's very frustrating for parents and for me and for me believe me um but what would you prefer would you prefer to get in early for an assessment and then know that you might still have to wait for therapy and and access it elsewhere or what what are your thoughts as parents Personally, I think that um, I would rather assessment and then get straight into it because a child can change in that year and then you'll probably just have to reassess again a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, so, but it would be more a case of you being then shown that, yes, it, it was something that you need to follow up, whether you wouldn't necessarily get the therapy straight away, but you might then know that at least you definitely need to follow up somewhere. Yeah. So I know we're on like five waiting lists for private and public like within our area and the school waiting list as well. But there's like one speech pathologist to lots of schools. So the demand is very high there as well in our area. Mm -hmm. um, we've just had a, a lot of trouble privately and publicly getting in. I've been trying since he was about two and a half and he's it's next month. Like, yeah. 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 Well, um, Layla's saying you prefer an early assessment, even if you might have to wait. Yeah, look, we'll send you a list of the private therapists that we recommend because we know that they've been trained in the therapy. And look, I hear you. I really do. It is such a concern for me as well. And I wish that, yeah, I, all I can say is we are advocating, we're trying to get increased. Molly as well wants to prefer to be assessed before then um, and then know at least whether or not it's something to worry about. Yeah. Look, um, yeah, it's good. That's good feedback for us. But yeah, so maybe over the Christmas period, I can do some bulk screening assessments for you guys. And then just even if it's not. Layla has a question as well. Hello, Layla. Yeah, so just so even saying that how I might be able to, you know, get on to your specific child earlier and then at least you know what's going on. Okay. Layla, your sound is. Offense, but <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Just um, I just wanted to ask. Um, you need to tell how it's getting. Uh, sorry, it's something about telehealth. Yeah, telehealth getting. What about them? Uh, you need to. Uh, is that is that throughout the the program or um, that the assessment? Is it when when? So, so you would do you would do your assessment, but we would get. Yeah, so I'll get you to mute again because you're. I'm not sure why you've got all that background. Oh, I just muted you. Yeah. Um, the thing is, we would get. What we do is get parents to record a natural conversation with their child, and then we would use that to help us evaluate the child's stuttering, as opposed to them coming in. So it's still just as a way of us getting information about your child's stuttering as opposed to them coming in and us talking to them. And sometimes children don't want to talk when they come into the sessions and parents say, he 
usually Sutter's more or this is, you know, not him. He's like, it does happen that way. So the recording with the parent is sometimes more effective for us in terms of evaluation. And also even in telehealth, the children, uh, like we can provide feedback to the parents about how they're implementing the program using their recordings as opposed to them coming in and us watching them in the clinic to do the therapy and then saying, okay, can you try this? Can you try that? So getting parents to record the parent, the child's language as well as their practice sessions is just as effective or more, I think actually more because we can then get insight into what's going on for the parents as, as well in a natural setting because obviously clinical um, evaluations are outside the child's normal environment. So it, I think it's in some ways more effective than the, the kind of regular face-to-face -face sessions. Anyway. Yeah, okay. So general feedback from people is that early assessment would be more effective. Um, if you guys wanted to, I would be happy for you to send me a short recording of your child's speech and we can just um, give you some information, like give you some feedback. If you wanted to, to email that to us, just a short recording, we can actually, you know, give you some early information other, uh, rather than waiting for the official long, like the assessment, which would be more complex and more in depth. But if you just want us to listen to your child's speech and say, yes, we think this is Definitely stuttering, you should follow it up. I would be happy to do that. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, could you like maybe give us something we could get them to uh, repeat after us to pick up? Like, so when you, we send you a video, like what do we get them just to have a chat to us in their normal environment? Yeah. Or is there something you would it, like? Just as part of the, an assessment, we, if you sent us a short video, we can have a listen to it and say, oh yes, we think that child is definitely stuttering or doesn't really sound like stuttering. It sounds like it may be that he's just developing language. You know, there could be, and I think, you know, if you've already sent in your case history information, that, that's helpful. But normally in an assessment, we would go through all the background history, look at whether or not there's any stuttering in the past or um, first degree relative usually is maybe a, um, an indicator that the child's stuttering and will need therapy. So not everyone needs therapy. Some people, some children just resolve this disfluency. Uh, it's more just about them getting their thoughts organized. Other children do need to have this more intensive therapy. So really what I'm saying is to you that there's an option that if you wanted to send me a little bit of a video of your child or audio even um, of them chatting to you to give me an idea, I can send you back very quickly yeah, definitely you're on the right path and um, you should definitely either seek treatment elsewhere or we'll keep you on the waiting list for treatment at, at, at La Trobe. Look, we're looking at other options, maybe group therapy is the other option for parents. So you would then attend with other parents and you would still send in your video recordings, but you would be... Um, given feedback in more of a group setting as opposed to individually. And then we might be able to go, you know, more intensively get through more people. Email address is just p.ferrari at latrobe.edu.au. I'll put it in the chat. Um, I'm just trying to find ways, because I'm a parent, I would be wanting exactly what you guys want, which is access to effective therapy for a significant issue. I'm just saying there's a lot of chat comments in here I haven't addressed yet. I'm just having a look. Natalie, I spoke to you about with your child. Yeah, exactly. Samantha, that's the thing. If they don't, and that has happened, that has happened to children who've come in and they're they've been told, oh no, they're not stuttering. But in fact, they're just not stuttering on the day. <laughs> and I get that. So that's why a recording of them talking in more natural environment is more helpful really. Because what the research has told us, if anything, parents know their child. Parents know when their child is stuttering. And parents know when there's a problem. 
So I think that that is the sort of research I listen to and that I read is that, you know, and you, I need, you need to trust your concerns and don't listen to people who say, don't worry about it. That's what I would say. But worrying about it and then having something to do about it, there's two, two different um, issues there. Am I helping? <laughs> Am I helping? Questions? Did that email address come through? I sent it into the chat. Can you see? No, it didn't, it didn't come through. Oh, no, I can you? send it if you like. Who did I send it to? Oh, I'm probably just sent, oh. I sent it to the waiting room. Hang on. Sorry. E dot Ferrari at latrobe.edu.au. Pretty sure that's my email address. Yeah. Um, and we'll get students to look at the videos and help with that as well, because we are a student-based clinic and the students are quite expert in terms of their evaluation of stuttering severity. So if I'm overwhelmed by videos, just to let you know that I might be outsourcing to students. Are you okay with that, Sunny and Jess? And oh, everybody yeah. Everybody yeah. else oh, online? Okay. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We want to help you. We are there for you. Like, we are so on your team. Mm -hmm. uh, so, after today, what we will do is we will send you the handouts of this, the sessions and a copy of the list of speech pathologists who work in Lidcombe. And um, there's a couple of other handouts that might be helpful just in terms of stuttering. But other than that, I'm moving you on to the next stage, which is from the parent information session waiting list to the assessment waiting list. <laughs> So at least you can kind of say, say yeah, well, I've progressed. <laughs> um, I'm can laughing, but I'm laughing in sympathy, not in, you know. Uh, we did a bit of a roll call just before everybody leaves. Okay, well. Sunny's just making sure that you do get put onto the right list. Because Two names we didn't we have need to know. We need to know that you are here so that we can pass, like, put it onto the list. So Sunny's just going to make sure that... So just either unmute yourself and say hello or just write it in the chat. Um, is Elizabeth Stacy here or partner of? So why don't we read the child's name maybe okay. and then okay. the child's name and if your child's name is read then just Shout out. put into the, the chat. Um, yeah, yeah. That's your child so that we've got a record and we can then make sure that you're definitely transferred over. And you it, will be based on, it will be based I on when you're referring to the so it, um, sorry, Hudson? Yeah. That's me, my son. Cool. Jonah, Nazrella. When they call us out. When they call us yes. out. Yes. Yes. Simrit, cool. There's Simrit there. Um, sorry. Daniel, Fadaseri. Daniel, Can you just put your Noah? name. Hmm. Yeah, just um, write your child's, child's name, name. Put your child's name in the chat. That might be the best thing. I think most people's names we've got, but it yeah. was just um, yeah. It was if your name was different to what you had put on the forms, then and just, just if really if you have your child's name in the chat, we've got the record of that, and that's what I'll use. Okay. Okay. We've got Noah, Macy, Alexandra. We've got Ahmed. We've got Charlie. Um, Aksan? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, okay, yes. Albert, Ella, and Emilio. Perfect. Now, just wait a sec, because I do have a parent information um, session survey. If you could complete it, that would be great. Look at the time. Preview. Okay. Um, sorry. So, um, any other questions?
just tell me if this this survey works because we had a bit of trouble with the link last time. Can you just tell me if that if that works? Yeah. Does that open? Can you see that survey? Thank you. Great. Okay. And if you could put your name, it does have a name as optional, but it would be a very short survey. Thank you, everyone. And you can definitely um, email me if you have further questions because we've got a lot of resources we can maybe share with you. As well, but I think the program is so effective that I can't recommend it enough. So, if your child is stuttering severely, then as soon as you get into some kind of good treatment, the better. That's all I, um, all I can say. So, have to go. No worries. Thanks for coming along. Thanks, everybody, and hopefully, um, you got something out of today. And thanks for doing the survey, really appreciate it. See you. Hopefully soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye, guys. Take care, everyone. Thanks. See ya. Bye. All right. Hopefully, I didn't just remove someone who I shouldn't have removed. No, I think that's all. Someone we're having trouble getting removed. All right, I'll just turn the waiting list back on. I mean, the waiting room back on. Well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It's intensive. I'll just stop the recording now.